Good morning, everybody. This is the Mac Road Church of Christ, uh, Sunday Isaiah study. Uh, we're in Isaiah chapter 61 and verse 6, and Nico's going to lead us in a prayer before we get started. Dear Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for all the blessings that you give us. Please watch over us. Some of us are sick, and some of us are fallen to sin. Please lead us on your path. We ask for you to forgive us for our sins. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thanks, Nico. No problem. All right, so we're looking in, in Isaiah chapter 61 and verse 6. Now, there's 66 chapters in Isaiah. By the way, when we're, when we're done with the book of Isaiah, our schedule says that we're going to be studying the minor prophets next. So we'll be looking into the minor prophets after we cover Isaiah. Uh, if you don't have your uh, uh, Isaiah booklet, there's two that are left up there. I think most people should have them. We're on, we're on lesson 24 in your booklet if you're looking there. And we're down to the end of that lesson. Uh, the lesson ends in chapter 61 and verse 8. And we're in 61 and verse 6. And so we're in this section that, that deals with the uh, <coughs> spiritual blessings that we're going to encounter in the Messiah when the Messiah shows up. It started in chapter 60 as Jesus quoted for us that, <clears throat> that section when he started talking to us about the fact that uh, it's uh, he, when he said it was fulfilled in your hearing when he was talking to the people at, at uh, uh, Nazareth and when he had gone in, and was preaching to them. And so Jesus confirms the fact that, that's, that this section is what you and I might call the uh, spiritual blessings that are found in the spiritual kingdom. There are some people, however, who are still looking for a physical kingdom. But I think as we go through here, we'll understand that all these references have to do with, with physical uh, ideas that illustrate spiritual realities. Remember also that as we're looking at Isaiah, when Isaiah wrote, the kingdom was, was divided over here. And Israel was going to go into Babylonian, into Assyrian captivity, and Judah was going to go into Babylonian captivity. And then he wrote about the fact that God had to bring them physically back in order for the Messiah to come. So they did go back to their land. They did build, rebuild the temple. They were reestablished, but they didn't have a king. And so and for all practical purposes, their nation wasn't complete because <clears throat> they, they weren't ruling over it. They, they had somebody else who was ruling over them, and that was at that time during Jesus' time, the Roman Empire. And so as, as God is explaining to us the blessings that we're going to get from being in the, in the kingdom of God, Isaiah chapter 62 talks about Zion's coming salvation. And this salvation isn't just this physical bringing back to the land. That had to happen in order for the, visit, for the spiritual uh, blessings to come, which is really where we find our blessings. Uh, but he's talking about, about the fact that uh, God is going to uh, be taking care of us. So he starts off in verse 6. Uh, well, let's just go ahead and start with verse 4 so we get the context. Uh, and, well, it helps if I'm in the right chapter, sorry. All right, and uh, if we start off with verse 4, it says, Then they will rebuild the ancient ruins, they will raise up the former devastations, and they will repair the ruined cities, the desolation of many generations. So he talks about the restoration and even though he did bring them back to this physical land, that's really not the fulfillment of this restoration that he's talking about. And that's why he says in verse 5, Strangers will stand and pasture their flock, and foreigners will, will be your farmers and your vine dressers. Uh, and here's where we're at today. Uh, but you will be called the priests of the Lord. You will be spoken of as ministers of our God. <clears throat> you will eat the wealth of the nations, and, and, and in their cities you will boast. Now, when Israel was, was the physical nation, God told them that when they are, were established or when, when they were formed, that they were supposed to be God's ministers, and they're supposed to be God's priests. In, in, in Exodus 19, in verse 6, he said, You shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the sons of Israel. So Israel was supposed to be those holy priests, they were supposed to be those people, but they really failed in their, in their uh, work. And so therefore, G God was calling these people who were going to come their holy priests. And the reason I'm pointing that out is because the Gentiles prior to this were not called God priests. Everybody knew from the Jewish community who the priests would be. So the fact that he says you're going to be called the priests of God indicates that they weren't the priests of God, but now they are the priests of God. 
And the Bible teaches that that's exactly who we are now in God's church. In 1 Peter chapter 2, in verse 9, he says, you are, a royal, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So God says that we, his church, are now his priests. So if you are in the church, you are a priest of God. We don't have in, the, in Jesus' church a dual class citizenship. We don't have priests up here and laity down here or just normal, normal Christians down here where the priests are up here and the Christians are down here. In God's community, all of us are priests. Each and every one of us is a priest. Each and every one of us is to do the work of a priest. And what is it that a priest is supposed to do according to 1 Peter 2 and verse 9? What are we supposed to do? Proclaim the excellencies of him who is called out of darkness. <clears throat> so as God's priests, we, we give the majority of our time preaching about Jesus, teaching about Jesus, telling people about the kingdom of God. That's what we do. In Revelation chapter 1 and verse 6, six it says, And he made us to be a kingdom, priest to his God and Father. To him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. So we're going to be called, God's church is going to be called, the, the, those Gentiles that get into it, as well as any faithful Jews, are going to be called the priests of God. And he says in verse 6, and you will be, be spoken of as ministers of our God. Now, our problem when, when we read this word ministers is we have, because of church, elevated that, that statement and made it like they're the clergy. The clergy are the ministers, and then you have the regular people that sit on the pews. The clergy, they do the preaching, they do the teaching, they, 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 run, the, they run the church, and the people underneath, they're the people who follow them. And, and that's not what the Bible teaches. What the Bible teaches is that every single one of us is a minister of God. And besides, uh, as a minister, it's not a position of elevation, it's a position of service. The word minister means to serve, and, and that's what ministers are supposed to do. So we're not to look up to ministers from the standpoint that we think they're better than, than other people, because all of us minister in some way. If you're a mom and you're raising your children according to what God says, you're ministering. If you're a boss and you're, and you're, and you're treating your employees the way God wants you to, you're ministering. We're all ministers of God. And, and the problem is, is that we take those, those terms and we've turned them into titles instead of positions, and therefore people are confused about what ministers are and their job, and they look at ministers different than they do the regular people. Uh, and so that's why Paul in... Uh, in um, in um, places like 1 Corinthians 3, where he's explaining what, who, who, the, who uh, the apostles and preachers and people like that are, he says in verse 5 of 1 Corinthians 3, What then is Apollos, and what is Paul? Servants through whom you believe, even as the Lord gave opportunity to each. So Paul says, I'm a servant, Apollos is a servant, we're, we're not any more special than you are, the only difference is, is God gave us a message to tell you, and that's what we're doing. But each of us is supposed to be a minister of God, and so that's one of the things that you're going to see uh, uh, in this new relationship. And he says, you will eat the wealth of the nations, and in their riches you will boast. In other words, that when Gentiles come in, they're, as we've mentioned before, they're going to bring in all their resources and all of their their." Um, um, financial attributes and, and all the blessings that God has given them, and they're going to use that for God. In verse 7, he says, instead of your shame, you will have a double portion. Now, their shame was here. When they went off into captivity, Israel was in captivity, Judah's in captivity, that was their shame. Even during this period, though they are established as a group of people that are living in, in Judah, they really uh, aren't governing their own place and so they're governed by somebody else, and so they, they have this shame, you might say. Uh, and it says, in, instead of shame or humiliation, uh, uh, they will shout for joy over their portion. Therefore, they will possess a double portion in the land. Uh, uh, everlasting joy will be theirs. So, so what he points out is that in this kingdom over here, we're going to be filled with joy. We're going to have joy as Jesus is our king, 
and that we know that no matter what happens to us here, we're not going to lose anything. So we have this, this eternal joy and, and this eternal blessings that, that we're going to have, uh, which is one of the reasons why we uh, uh, rejoice in the Lord. And then he says, uh, and, and, there will, and there they will possess a double portion in their land. Now, the idea of a double portion is, is the idea of being blessed by God. Uh, do you remember uh, who Elijah and Elisha were? They were the two prophets, right? So Elijah was first. And when uh, Elijah, Elijah commissioned Elisha, what did he ask uh, uh, Elisha? What did, he, what did he tell Elisha? Well, uh, Elijah said to Eli, Elisha, what do you want? You know, when I leave, what do you want? And he said, I want a double portion of what you have, right? Right. Uh, and in Job chapter 42 and verse 10, I remember God took away his family, his property, and all that, right? Uh, and in, when God blessed him in Job 42 and verse 10, it says, The Lord restored the fortunes of Job when he prayed for his friends, and the Lord increased all that Job had twofold, or twice as much, a double portion. So the idea of a double portion is that you're, that you're blessed, okay? The oldest... Uh, son would, would, would get a double portion of, of uh, the goods, you might say. And so that's the idea. So they're going to possess a double portion, and they'll be in the land forever. He says, uh, everlasting joy will, will be theirs. Nobody will be able to take our joy away because uh, we'll have it in um, 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse 16. It says, now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God, our Father, who has loved us and given us eternal comfort and good hope by grace. So we have this eternal comfort and we have this good uh, uh, grace that God's bestowed upon us. Verse 8, he says, For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery in burnt offerings, and I will faithfully give them their recompense and make an everlasting covenant with them. Now, he's talking about the, the new creation. He's talking about what you and I would call the church, what you and I call those people under, under God's kingdom. That's who he's talking about here. Remember that as you read this. He says, for I, the Lord, love justice. In other words, why are they going to get a double portion? Why, why are they going to enjoy these blessings? And the answer is because the Lord loves justice. So, so the Lord uh, loves what's right. Okay? Uh, there's a number of, of passages that tell us about the Lord and righteousness. In Psalms 111 and verse 7, he says, For the Lord is righteous, he loves righteousness, the upright will, will behold his face. So people who are upright will behold his face. So why are these people getting a double portion? Why are they going to be called priests of God and ministers of God? Because they're upholding righteousness. That's what God wants. God wants people who uphold righteousness. Uh, in Psalm 33, 5, he says, He loves righteousness and justice, and the earth is full of the loving kindness of the Lord. So, so righteousness and justice have something to do with loving kindness because he says, I love righteousness and justice and the earth needs to be filled with loving kindness. So God's loving kindness is the idea of righteousness and justice. Loving kindness means doing what's right. It means being gracious and merciful. It means uh, upholding the truth. It means uh, 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 standing for what's right, uh, not things like robbery and those kind of things. Uh, he says, and that's why, that's why the next part says, I hate robbery and burnt offering. In other words, what he's saying is he hates fake religion. He hates, pe he hates people who just pretend at religion. That, that, the, that's why he says, I hate robbery and burnt offerings. <clears throat> you might think, well, what does that mean? What that means is some people come and they offer God offerings, but then they go out and lie and cheat and steal and rob and do all kinds of stuff that they're not supposed to do. And God says, I I'm not pleased with that. That's not justice. That's not righteousness. That's not true religion. If you, if you remember in, in um, Isaiah chapter 1, as, as Isaiah op opened up this chapter with God, he says uh, down here in verse, um, verse 11, Isaiah 111, he says, What are your multiplied sacrifices to me, says the Lord? I have uh, I have had enough of burnt offering in rams and the fat of fed cattle, and I take no pleasure in the blood of bulls, lambs, and goats. When you come up, uh, uh, when you appear before me, who requires of you this trampling of my court? 
Bring your worthless offerings no longer. Incense is an abomination to me. New moons and a Sabbath, the calling of assembly I cannot endure. Iniquity and the solemn assembly. He says, I hate your new moons. Well, why, why does he do all that? Because as they're doing those things religiously, their, their personal conduct is that they're hateful, they're, they're greedy, they're selfish, they only care about themselves, they hurt people, they're violent, they, they're, doing, they're doing everything that goes against God's idea of character. So these people in Isaiah 61 and verse 8, when he's talking about them, the reason they're going to be blessed is because they don't have pretentious religion. They're, they're, they're sincere in their religion. They're, they're, they really do care about God. They really are trying to do what he wants them to do. Uh, and so he, uh, he says in verse 8, For I, the Lord, love justice, and I hate robbery and burnt offerings. And I will faithfully give them, these people who are not double-tongued in their worship, he says, and I will give them their recompense and make an everlasting covenant with them. So God says that as a result of, of us being, being faithful and sincere in our worship and, and, and uh, following an obedience of God, that he's going to make this everlasting covenant with us. And, of course, that everlasting covenant is different than this covenant that he made with this nation. Because the covenant that he made with this nation was, if you break my covenant, then you are going to be condemned. And that's why God had to make a new covenant, because they broke it. So when they broke it, it was broken, and God made a new covenant. Now, it says he made a new covenant with Israel and Judah. In other words, he, he's making a new covenant uh, with the world, and Israel and Judah represent his people. So he's making, he's making a new covenant, but the new covenant is not a national covenant. It's an individual covenant. It's a covenant where each individual person decides their relationship with God. And so in, in Jeremiah chapter 32 and verse 40, where Jeremiah is writing about this new covenant, he said, I will, make a new, uh, I will make an everlasting covenant with them, that I will not turn away from them, to do them, good, uh, to do them good, and I will put the fear of me in their hearts, so that they will uh, will not turn away from me. So God said the difference is this covenant over here is going to be an an, uh, an individual, independent covenant where each person can decide his own fate instead of depending on the nation and the faithfulness of the nation to do what God says. And that's what's happening in our country today. Supposedly, we started off as this Christian nation. How Christian are we now? with all the rules and, and all of the things that are going on with the gender movement and abortion and, and you know, all the other things that are going on in, in, and that are being legislated in, in our government about what we're, what we're supposed to do. But the good thing is we're not under their control. We're under Jesus' control. And each one of us can be faithful to God even though our government is not. We're, we're not tied into our government anymore. They were. The national, the national kingdom was tied into their government. What their government did, they were responsible for. Uh, but not so much today anymore. So in Hebrews 13 and verse 20, he says, Now the God of peace, who brought up from the dead the great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the eternal covenant, even Jesus our Lord, equip you in every good work, in every good thing to do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. See, the problem with the blood of bulls and goats over here in these covenants was that they couldn't really take away your sins. They, they couldn't do away with your sins. Jesus comes and he makes a new covenant with his blood, and his blood is able to take away our sins. So if we sin under this covenant over here, God can forgive us through the blood of Jesus. So over here, if you sin under this covenant... The, the blood of animals and bulls and goats didn't really take away your sins. They didn't take them away. You, you were still guilty, you might say. But in Jesus, our sins are forgiven. That, that's where our sins are forgiven. And so, therefore, God's making this new covenant. And that is why God brought Israel, the physical nation, back to the land to have them here when Jesus showed up and the temple built so that Jesus could fulfill the promises that were given to them uh, about the, the kingdom of God. And so he says, and I will faithfully give them their recompense and make an everlasting covenant with them. Verse 9, then their offspring will, will be known among the nations and, and their descendants in the midst of the peoples. Uh, uh, all who see them will recognize them because they are the offspring whom the Lord has blessed. Now, if you remember in, in uh, Acts chapter 11, 
in Acts chapter 11, where Paul is at the church at Antioch. Uh, it says down here in Acts 11 and verse, <coughs> at verse, uh, well, we'll start at verse 23, Acts eleven twenty-three. 23. It says, then when he arrived, this is Barnabas, then when he arrived at Antioch, uh, and witnessed the grace of God, he rejoiced and began to encourage them all with resolute heart to remain true to the Lord. For he was a good man and full of the Holy Spirit and of faith, and considerable number were being brought to the Lord. And he, and he left for Tarsus to look for Saul, that's the apostle. And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. And for an entire year, they met with the church and taught considerable number. And the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. So, so here's where the Christians are, where the disciples are called Christians. Well, who was calling them Christians? The world was. The world was saying, "Oh, you're a follower of this Jesus guy, or you're you're a follower of Christ." Uh, and, and there's only three places in the Bible where you ha where you have the word Christian, and each one of those places seems to be a place where the Gentiles or the sinful people were calling God's, God's people Christians in a derogatory manner. Or oh, you're one of those Christian people. That's who you are. Uh, and so they're recognized. And, and in, in um, 1 Peter chapter 4. Hi, Elaine. In 1 Peter chapter 4, and down here at verse 12, Look at what it says. It says, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeals among you, so they're being persecuted, which comes upon you for your testing as though some strange thing were happening to you. But to the degree that you share the suffering of Christ, keep on rejoicing, so that also at the revelation of his glory you may rejoice with exaltation. If you are reviled for the name of Christ, you are blessed, because the spirit of, of glory and of God rests upon you. Make sure that none of you suffers as a murderer or, or thief or evildoer or a troublesome meddler. But if anyone suffers as a Christian, he is not to be ashamed, but is to glorify God in this name. So they were recognized as God's people. They were recognized as Christians. And as a result of that, many of them were being persecuted because they saw them as, as God's people. And they saw them as individuals that were not going to submit to the Roman rule that went against God, just like today. People don't, in America, people really don't like Christians because we don't submit to some of the civil and, and uh, judicial rules that, our, that our, uh, our, our Senate and our Congress have passed and our, and our president have passed. We don't follow those rules. We don't keep those rules, so they don't like us. Uh, and, and, and they really want to get rid of us because we stand in opposition to some of the things that are going on. And so they recognize that we're doing that because we're God's people. Now, they might not believe in God, but they believe that we believe in God. And they're looking at, it, at us like that. And so in Isaiah 61, 9, it says, Then their offspring will be known among the nations. See, the, the, uh, the world knows who Christians are, and their descendants in the midst of the peoples. All who see them will, will, will recognize them because they are the offspring whom the Lord is blessed. Now, it doesn't say that they're going to recognize them and say, Oh, how wonderful, you're a Christian. No, it just says they're going to recognize them as God's people. Uh, I had my teeth cleaned this last uh Friday, and the, the technician who was cleaning my teeth, I, I was talking with her, and I asked her what she's doing for the holidays, and she said, oh, well, you know, she's entertaining, and I said, are, are, are you fixing anything, any certain dish that's different than the normal that we fix? Her? She says, yeah, we're fixing Afghanistan rice, and so I began talking to her, and I found out that she's Islamic, and, and I said, so in, in Afghanistan where you live, what's the, what's the main religion? You, you know what it is, right? Islam, and she said, and there's a few Christians, a few. See, so the world recognizes we're out there, whether they accept us or not. And, and in, in many places, they're being persecuted because of their recognition. And so Jesus is pointing out that we're going to be recognized because we're God's people, because we stand up for him. And, and so he says, because they are the offspring whom the Lord has blessed. So the reason that God's people over here are being blessed is because they're willing to suffer for Jesus. They're willing to stand up for Jesus. The Jewish community wasn't willing to stand up for the Messiah over here. 
They, they, they were doing their own things. The, the Israelite people wanted their own kind of king, wanted their own system. They were trying to overthrow the Roman Empire so that they could have their own king rule and, and their own kingdom set up instead of trusting God and doing what God says. And that's why many people today still don't accept Jesus as the Messiah because he didn't fulfill a physical kingdom that they're looking for or that they think is supposed to happen. And even some of our Christian friends believe that Jesus hasn't done that until they say the thousand-year reign shows up after Jesus shows up and the rapture happens and all that, then God's going to set up his kingdom over here. It really hasn't been set up yet. And they fail to understand all these spiritual uh, realities that are being described for us in physical terms. Uh, and so he says in verse 10, I will rejoice greatly in the Lord. My soul will exalt in my God. He says, for he has clothed me with garments of salvation. He has wrapped me with a robe of righteousness as a bridegroom uh, decks himself with garland and as a bride uh, adorns herself with her jewels. In other words, what, what Isaiah is saying is, is, is over here, we're going to be decked in righteousness. We're, we're going to be clothed in righteousness. And our righteousness over here, uh, who do we clothe ourselves with? Jesus. And when do we clothe ourselves with Jesus? When we're baptized. In Galatians 3 and verse 26 and 27, it says, uh, uh, For you're all sons of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who have been baptized in Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. So if you haven't been baptized in Christ's name, you're not clothed with Christ yet. You're still in your, in your uh, uh, filthy, sinful unrighteousness. And you need to get right with God before it's too late. God's not going to force you to do anything, but God's going to encourage you and plead with you and do everything he can to help you um, uh, get into him. So, so we're clothed with righteousness, and that righteousness comes from God and, and is found in Jesus. And if you want a, a big explanation of that, you can go to Romans chapter 3. But, and verse 22 just simply says, Even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe where there's no distinction. And so he, he points out that our righteousness is found in Christ by faith. We believe in his righteousness. We believe in what he's done for us. We believe in who he is. We believe that he, that he rules over us. We believe, and so therefore, since we believe, we are putting on him, and, when, and no person gets baptized the right way who doesn't first believe. There's a lot of people who get baptized because their parents baptize them when they're babies, but that's not really the baptism you find in the Bible. In the Bible, you believe first, you believe who Jesus is, you recognize your sins, you recognize they need to be forgiven, and you need the righteousness of God. And then you come to him so he can clothe you with garments of salvation, and he has wrapped you with the robe of righteousness. He says, kind of like a bridegroom who gets ready for, 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 the, for the wedding and the and the. Uh, bride who puts on her attire and they're getting ready for this wedding they put on the proper clothing and that's what he's that's what he's illustrating here you see the reason that these people fell the jewish community fell they didn't have on the proper clothing they didn't have the clothing of righteousness and justice and love and kindness they had on the clothing of self-righteousness of, of arrogance of we're better than you are of uh, uh, racism uh, we're, we're better than the Samaritans. We're better than the than uh, the Gentile nations. We're better people. That's what they put on. That's not the garments of God. That that's not the garments that God's bride is supposed to put on, and that's not the garment that Je that Jesus puts on. But these individuals, they're going to be clothed with the right garments. They're going to be clothed with the with the garments that that come from God. And certainly, you remember the the parable about the king who had a, had a dinner party. Remember, remember him who had a dinner party. And, he, and the guests that were invited, they wouldn't come, remember? And so he then sent his servants into the streets to gather all the people, remember? And they all came, and the wedding feast was full. But then the king is going through the, through the um, uh, guests, and who does he find? He finds somebody without the right clothes on. And he says, why didn't you prepare for the wedding? And you, and you might think, and some people think, well, maybe he was poor. Maybe he didn't have any clothes because, after all, they got him off the streets. Well, what you need to understand in their culture, in their time, the, the person who was throwing the wedding party, they paid for everything. See, in our culture, 
we're so selfish and we're so greedy that we don't even pay for our for our bridesmaids and our and our groomsmen. We don't even pay for their attire. We make them pay for the attire. We tell them what to get and we make them pay for it. Like if it's some kind of honor to be in our wedding, so you have to pay for it. And we use the rest of the money for ourselves to have this gigantic, huge wedding. That's not the way it was in their day and time. In their day and time, if you invited somebody to, to, to be a wedding guest, you paid for their attire. So when the king says, where's your attire? The guy goes, I don't know. He must have been a teenager. He goes, I don't know. <laughs> he gets thrown out because he's unwilling to put on the attire. That's the attire God says we're to put on. That's not the attire that the Jewish community had. And they didn't have on that attire. Uh, they cared more about rituals and looking good than they did about actually serving God and doing his will. <clears throat> yes? I like that one step further, that the picture of when we, when we put all of Christ, he is our robe of righteousness. He is, he is our, our attire. And if we don't have his attire, then we don't get to go into the wedding. That's right. <clears throat> and it's more than just doing the right thing because other religions teach their people to kind of do the right thing okay so it's not just doing the right thing it's recognizing that we need a sacrifice and jesus is the one who makes that sacrifice for us As, as they did back then? Um, I'm not sure if, if, their, if their social customs are the same. I know for national Israelites, it's not necessarily. I don't know about the Orthodox Jews, so, so I'm not sure. But I would suspect some of them are. Yes. Mm -hmm. In the New American Standard, it said, as a bridegroom decks himself with the garland, I'm not sure what version of it is reading, but it says that the bridegroom wears a turban. Do you know the difference in that interpretation? Is it just from, from a Greek word that should be? The answer is no. Okay. I don't. I, I, haven't, don't. I haven't looked <laughs> in, in, into it that much. Uh, let, let's see, what, is, what does the King James say? Um, yeah, see, the King James just says ornaments, decked with ornaments. And so it could be the adorn, uh, ornament that goes on the turban or an ornament around the neck. But it's the, it's the idea of putting on the, the, the wedding attire that would be customary in their, in their day and time. That's probably why uh, the New American Standard says garland and some of the other ones say a turban, because that would all be included in the, the garb they would put on. And just told me the verse is the New American Standard, but it's so it's the new New American Standard. The new, new there you go. Okay. <clears throat> right. All right. So verse, um, so verse 11 says, Whereas the earth brings forth its sprouts, and as a garden causes the things sown in it to spring up, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring up before all nations. And so the Lord is the one who is going to cause us to be righteous. The Lord is the one who is going to bless us. The Lord is the one who is going to uh, cause things to grow. And certainly that, that reminds us of the um, parable that Jesus gave about the farmer who planted um, his seed and he goes to bed and he doesn't know how, but all of a sudden the crops come up. It's kind of like you. I mean, you know, you, you take a little tomato seed that doesn't look anything like a tomato, right? And you stick it in the ground and what happens? Out comes this tomato plant looks entirely different. How does that happen? We don't know. God does it. The only reason that tomato seed works is because it has the life that God put in it. God's the one that caused it to grow. And that's also true in the spiritual kingdom. God's the one who, ca God's the one who causes these people to, to grow. Now, that doesn't mean we don't have a part in it. Uh, it depends on our hearts. If when God sows the seed in our hearts, if we have good soil, just like that tomato seed, if it's planted in good soil, it's going to grow. If you plant that tomato seed in concrete, it's probably not going to grow. Uh, 
And so that's the same thing that he's, that he's saying here, that, that the Lord is going to cause, cause it to grow. And, and that's really exciting for us because what that means is that the Lord is affecting a work in us, that he's doing it. And we are his workmanship. And if you remember, that's what Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10 says. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. So God is working in us. And, and the way he works in us is by us doing things. And when, if we have enough Bible in us, when we do something that's not right, it pricks us. And we go, oh, that's wrong. I need to get rid of that. And then we start to grow more in that area. But if you have very little Bible in you, when you do something wrong, you won't know it's wrong because you don't have enough of the seed in you. But if you have the seed in you, then that God's work is going to work, which is why we encourage you to make sure and read your Bibles throughout the, throughout the year. All right, anything, anything in, uh, in chapter 61? All right, chapter 62. Now remember that the chapter divisions were put in here by a man. They weren't put in here by God. And so it says, for Zion's sake, I will not keep silent. And for Jerusalem's sake, I will not keep quiet until her righteousness goes forth like brightness and her salvation like a torch that is burning. And, and so God says that he's not going to stop until righteousness comes. Way over here in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve sinned, right? Now, before they sinned, on the seventh day, it said God did what? He rested. It said he rested. And some people think, well, he rested, and therefore he just kind of lets the world go by itself, and he doesn't do anything else. He just, he's done. He's going to see what happens now that he rested. He's just looking. But if you remember over here, when Jesus was around, Jesus says, the Father and I are still working. We're working. Well, then, how come over here you said you rested, but over here you said you're working? Well, because something happened between the time he was resting and the time he was working, and that is that sin entered into the picture, and God says, I'm going to do whatever I need to in order to redeem them, in order to save them, so I'm going to work, not by physically creating things, not by creating, physically creating a new world, but he's, he's going to do things in order to bring righteousness and in order to bring about uh, um, their, their light so that they can be saved. That's what he says in, in 62 verse 1. For, for Zion's sake, I will not keep silent. In other words, he says, I, I'm going I'm to do whatever's required for me to bring righteousness. He says, and for Jerusalem's sake, I will not keep quiet until her righteousness goes forth like brightness and her salvation like a torch that is burning. So when he says, when he says uh, Jerusalem, he's referring to spiritual Zion. He's referring to physical Jerusalem, certainly, because that's where the message went out from. But he's talking about God's rule and, and the fact that God rules in Zion, which is another name for Jerusalem. And he says, I will not keep silent, and for Jerusalem's sake I will not keep quiet until her righteousness goes forth like brightness and her salvation like a torch that is burning. So God says, I'm going to do whatever's required to try to save Israel. And I want you to understand something. He's not just talking about the, the, the church over here, but he's also talking about these people that lived over here before Jesus came. The blood of Jesus goes backwards and forwards. And so uh, if Adam is going to be saved and if, if, uh, if uh, Abel is saved, they're saved by the blood of Jesus. If Daniel is saved, he's saved by the blood of Jesus. If David is saved, he's saved by the blood of Jesus. So God is concerned about Israel. He is concerned about all those people, but not just the Jewish community. He's also concerned about the Gentile community and all those who are trying to do right and want to come to him. And so, so God says, and I will not keep quiet until her righteousness goes forth like, like brightness and her salvation like a torch that is burning. When, when Jesus started his ministry, he said that the Gentiles have seen a great light. That's this burning that's under consideration. That's this light. In other words, they're seeing the salvation that comes from God. Over here, when God created the world, uh, how was the world when God first created it? It was void and dark and chaotic until what happened? What did God say the first day? 
Let there be light. And when he created light, now what happened to the world? It starts to change. Well, that's what we do over here. You see, you and I are this dead world. But when the light of Jesus comes into us, we start getting alive and things start changing in our life. And God starts reforming stuff, our attitudes, our, our dispositions, our actions, how we spend our money, what we do in our recreational time. God starts working in our life through the light that comes, but the light has to, has to come. And Jesus says he's the light. It's going to burn like a torch. And he says in verse 2, And the nation will see your righteousness and all kings your glory, and you will be called by a new name which the mouth of the Lord will, will designate. Now, uh, real quick, our time's almost up, but I want to just mention something, that some people think this new name is the name that we mentioned over in Acts chapter 11, where it says the Christians were first called, or the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. But if you go down a little bit further, okay, if you come down here to, to verse 4, look at verse 4. He says, it will no longer be said to you, forsaken. See, that was, that was Israel's name. They were forsaken. Nor your land will, uh, will it any longer be called desolate. That was the name of their land. But you will be called, my delight is in her. So the new name they get is, my delight is in her. Over here, God rejected Israel. Over here, God delights in faithful Israel. God delights in the church. I'd suggest to you that that's the, the name under consideration as, as, you, as you discuss that or as you think about that, and that the idea of the name Christian, it was used by the Gentile community to malign God's people. Yes. New American Standard. That's the one Jesus used. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and Jesus' disciples now use the new, new American standard. <laughs> All right, so we're going to have to stop there, but I just wanted to point that out to you. Um, any questions or thoughts down that far? Anything anybody wants to add or mention? Yes. Uh huh. Which means. See, see, the New American Standard uh, translates it. That just gives you the name. And that's why the New American Standard says, uh, it will no longer be said to you forsaken, okay, nor to, the, to your land uh, uh, will, it, uh, will it any longer be called desolate, but you will be called, my delight is in her. It's kind, it's, it's kind, of, like the, it's kind of like the name Linda, okay? In, you know, everybody in, in English culture thinks Linda just means Linda. When they say Linda to me, it means beautiful. It's, it's a Spanish word for beautiful. It is Linda. Yes. It means the same thing to Bill. That's right. It means the same thing to Bill. Yeah, it better. So that's what they're doing here. That's why the New King James actually puts in the name where the New American Standard translates it. And you might have a footnote for it that actually translates it for you, okay? And, 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 and I believe that the reason it's translated is to help us understand it better. Because if they just gave us the name, we'd go, what does that mean, right? Mm -hmm. oh, I was just gonna say, just like Nico, short for awesome. There you go, just like Nico, short for awesome, yeah. yeah. In, in, in Nico's mind. Yeah. <laughs> All right, let, let's have ourselves a prayer and we'll be dismissed. All right, Father in heaven, we're just so thankful for the blessings, we're so thankful for the information that you give us that makes it so easy and apparent, Father, that your kingdom is here, that you're ruling your kingdom, that we can be your people, that we're clothed with your righteousness, that you have made us righteous, that you have forgiven us for our sins, that you've made a covenant with us that allows us, Father, that when we sin, to find grace and mercy, and that you can forgive us, because every good and perfect gift comes from you. We praise you and we thank you for Isaiah. We thank you for the words that he writes and for the fulfillment that was done when your son arrived and for the fulfillment that we're still enjoying. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen.